What's up guys? So this is a bit of a new video series I'm going to be trying out in the coming days. And this is kind of uh, something a little different, uh, just like that video game playing thing was yesterday. Uh, but this is something I'm also going to try to do a little bit more frequently than just once or twice, and maybe I'll make a little series. I do have the albums for this sort of predestined, so if you're going to write in the comments uh, for me to do a certain album or a certain band, I kind of have a plan for this already, and I might get to those after. We'll see how it goes. So this is a series that I'm tentatively titling Prog That Time Forgot. Bands that kind of slipped through the cracks and just never quite got the popularity of some of their peers of the day. You'll probably notice that a lot of these bands all tend to come from the same era because it was a bit of a weird time. There are some bands that are a little bit newer and a little bit older, but they all kind of come from that sort of early to mid-2000s period. And the first one that I'm going to be talking about is a band called Divinity Destroyed. High in the sky, I see you falling. Why do you think that I will catch you? Divinity Destroyed, so much edge, was a progressive metal band formed in 1999 in Toms River, New Jersey. This band never quite got to the status of many of the bands that they had toured with. It never quite put out an album that was massively successful. But the band did edge very close to success at certain points in their career. Now, this band was actually the inspiration behind this series. A band that I know quite a lot about and have owned all of their music but they just never quite got out of that local band stage. It didn't take long for Divinity Destroyed, after their formation in 1999, to put out their first album called Nocturnal Dawn. I wouldn't necessarily qualify this album as a full-fledged professional release. I own a physical copy of all of their albums, and this one is particularly rudimentary. You get a jewel case with a CD that has a printed on label and a lyric sheet. No cover, no artwork, just a CD. And the music on it was sort of, if you had to draw a square with its four corners being Opeth, Dream Theater, Dillinger Escape Plan, and System of a Down, this band's sound would be somewhere right in the middle. And the band's sound is very well reflected in this debut album. As raw and rudimentary as it is, this Nocturnal Dawn record actually provided some of the band's more well-known tracks, like Forsaken and Void. But there are also some very surprising technical tinges to this record, like the song Smoke and Mirrors, The Sleeper Has Awakened, and NVNDK. The album wasn't quite as heavy on death metal elements that the band would get into on later releases, but this is still one of their heavier releases, and one that doesn't quite focus as heavily on the progressive metal aspect. It's a little bit more of a straightforward kind of metal album. In 2003, the band put out their second release, and I, the one that I would almost kind of say is their first proper release. The Divinity Destroyed EP, sold in a actually pretty well-made digipack with album cover artwork and lyrics printed inside and a CD that wasn't just a paper label stuck on. This is their first professionally made album. And it's a rather short one at just barely over 15 minutes long. It's a five track EP and it kind of plays like one straight through composition. There's also a lot of use of leitmotif on this record, which is really great. You feel that there's the themes that kind of pop in from the beginning and recapitulate at the end. 
it's a very well composed piece of music and probably one of my favorite EPs ever released by any band. Just like their first record, Nocturnal Dawn, uh, the Divinity Destroyed EP never really gets into the sort of death metal aspects, but there are still some like good deep growls on a couple of tracks. And this was around the time that the band really started to go out on tour more often, playing shows with bands such as Overkill, Misfits, Cradle of Filth, becoming quite a well-known opening band in their own right. Later in 2003, the band would sign to Screaming Ferret Records and release their second full-length album, the eight-track Eden in Ashes. This is by far the band's most well-known album and the one that maybe has the most international reach. It's actually kind of a funny story that I was introduced to this local-level band from New Jersey by an online friend of mine from the Netherlands, of all places. So, yeah, this is kind of the first album by the band that really sort of broke the barriers of just their local area and got them a little bit more notoriety outside of their home territory. And for many, this album is the one that's kind of their best regarded, their magnum opus, if you will. This one plays the most heavily off of the band's progressive metal influences, as well as their death metal influences, and brings in a lot more of their sort of outside influences as well, like Japanese folk music, video game soundtracks. The band has frequently cited the works of Nobuo Uematsu, of Final Fantasy Square Enix fame as a major influence on their style of music, and you can hear it in certain parts of tracks like Borealis, Nothing But a Shadow, and some of the movie soundtracks that they've cited as direct influences have been soundtracks for movies such as Terminator 2, particularly They cited in the song Disciple that the sound of the synthesizer during the T-1000's entrance was a major influence on that particular song. Even despite the increase in technicality and musicianship on this record, the band never quite got to the level of a band like Dillinger Escape Plan or Dream Theater for just going over the top. There was always a very solid song and very singable, melodic choruses over everything that they've done. And this album is probably the best example of a sort of synergistic melding of the two ideas. Riding the high that the band got from releasing Eden and Ashes, the band would actually see themselves going out on tour more, and even caught the attention of Gigantour, which, as we all know, is Dave Mustaine's sort of mega metal tour, and this was on the first edition where they were opening for acts like Dillinger Escape Plan, Fear Factory, Dream Theater, Symphony X, Nevermore. So a lot of really big, heavy-hitting names on a really big, heavy-hitting tour. They competed for the spot on that show and were awarded it by doing a radio station battle of the bands in their home state. And after that point, got several positive write-ups in magazines like Metal Maniacs and even a couple of articles in Billboard. Their next release would be another short EP, The Plague, and... It was a little bit different from the last one in that it was sort of split into two halves. The first half of the EP is three brand new songs, kind of continuing in the same vein as Eden and Ashes, although maybe a little bit more on the melodic and more well-polished side, capitalizing on the band's sort of increase in attention over the years. It seemed that the band was able to afford to bring their recording standards up to a little bit more of something that you would see on a more well-polished, well-produced band's album. But then the second half of the EP was acoustic versions of songs from the band's first recording, Nocturnal Dawn, and 
sort of reinterpreting those songs in a little bit more of a folky singer-songwriter kind of environment. Now, I first heard of the band around the time that they had released The Plague, and it was actually the last album of theirs I was able to purchase. So this is about where I started to get into the band and where my interest in them started to grow. So this is about the time where I started to actually anticipate releases from Divinity Destroyed. And the band would put out a single called Forever and Never in 2006, and that sort of became the band's first song with a music video, and the first time that I had listened to a song of theirs after having already heard the rest of their discography and sort of having opinions. Now, this was around the time as well that the band started to have a bit of a lineup shakeup. One of their guitar players had left the band, and the band's vocalist, Mark Ward, who was also the guitar player in the band at the time, decided to shift over to keyboards, and they brought in Rick Flanagan from a band called Beyond the Flesh. I wouldn't say that their style had changed too drastically for this release, but the death metal vocal aspect was drastically cut from the band's sound, and there was a little bit more of an emphasis on keyboard playing on this song, Forever and Never. Now, they had teased the idea of doing a full-length album around this time, and that was sort of the plan, was they were going to put out a sort of a full-length follow-up to Eden and Ashes, but that never quite materialized. And the next year, they put out the four-track EP, Death or Glory, sort of using the four songs they were finishing from that sort of new album cycle that they had hoped to get on top of, but never quite got to do. Death or Glory took the band in a little bit more of a melodic and straightforward direction, not all that dissimilar from the direction they were going on Nocturnal Dawn, with the title track almost kind of evoking a very power metal sort of approach, and something very similar to something like Coheed and Cambria's Welcome Home. Threshold and Indigo were a little bit more upbeat, sort of pop-inspired tracks. Not necessarily pop songs in their own right, but definitely bringing in sort of a very accessible, melodic, major key kind of sound. And then, of course, there was a song Forever and Never, which I believe did get either a remix or remaster, maybe even a full re-recording for Death or Glory. Unfortunately, they wouldn't do too much behind this album. They did a couple of local shows, and then their drummer, Dan Leonard, unceremoniously quit the band. Now, taking a listen to basically anything from the band's albums that feature him as a drummer, it's pretty clear why the band would not really be able to continue without him. His drumming is just incredible, and it would be very difficult to replace someone on his level. And the band did actually try to replace him with a couple of other drummers, but never quite got into it and they just decided it was better to throw in the towel at this point. And that was the last we heard of Divinity Destroyed. Or is it? Yesterday won't change, but we can learn from our mistakes. Embrace the change of pace, it'll all fall into place. Fast forward a few years, and the band actually started teasing new material. A lot of the material that the band had compiled in the hopes of following up Eden and Ashes kind of languished in development hell for a little while. And with Dan Leonard out of the band to pursue other interests and start a family, it seemed that this material was never going to see the light of day. But in 2011-2012, the band started to actually tease the idea that they were going to finally finish this new material. And in 2013, they dropped their final album, Nova. The musical style on Nova definitely feels like Death or Glory, a lot more melodic, a lot more straightforward, not quite as progressive or technical as Eden and Ashes. 
definitely feeling a little bit more like a proper follow-up to Death or Glory, fitting that some of the songs actually came from that era. But alas, this would be the last we'd hear of Divinity Destroyed. They wouldn't perform any concerts to support this new album. Uh, They simply went into the studio, finished the tracks, and released it as sort of a love letter and a thank you to their fans. So this is sort of the section where I talk about, like, the where are they now of the band. And, you know, what have they been doing in the time since they've broken up or... Have they gone on to success in any other ventures? Guitarist Rick Flanagan returned to his band Beyond the Flesh, and I believe they're still active, still sort of playing in a very local band capacity in their home state of New Jersey. I couldn't find any information on Dan Leonard, but uh, I assume he's probably living happily at home with his family. Brothers Tom and Mark Ward, who were sort of the originators of the band, Tom being the guitar player, I couldn't find much information on him, but it seems that Mark Ward is doing film work now with Garden State Productions. Despite the band having been officially broken up since 2007-2008, the band is actually maintaining their social media presence by sporadically posting on Facebook updates of what Mark's been doing with Garden State Productions and what Rick Flanagan's been doing with Beyond the Flesh. So it's kind of nice to see that they're still engaging with fans. They're still very grateful for that time spent in the band. It isn't something that they're looking back on in regret. And I think that makes me happy because it it sort of leaves a bit of a, a positive ending to their story. Even if the band never quite got to the echelons of popularity of some of their peers, they did release some absolutely incredible music, and I think if you can find a copy of Eden and Ashes, I consider that album a bona fide masterpiece, and absolutely worth adding to any progressive metal fan's collection. It's a shame that this band never quite got as popular as some of their peers, because They had all of the potential in the world, and even had some really high-level exposure. I mean, Billboard magazine Gigantour with Megadeth, of all things. There's no reason this band shouldn't have blossomed into something a lot more popular than they are. And it is kind of a shame, and you find that there's a lot of bands from this era that came very close to finding mainstream success, but never quite reached that level. And that's what this new video series I plan to do is all about. It's all about those stories of bands that should have become more popular than they were. Bands that had a lot of potential to become the next great thing and just never got brought up. So I've got a few more bands planned for this. And I can't wait to share these stories with you. Hopefully, I'll get chances to do videos like this. I'm hoping to do this once a month at the least. So in April, we will probably have another band that I'm going to go over. And like I said at the beginning of the video, I I have a few of these bands pre-planned. If you do want to suggest a band, please do feel free to leave a comment down below and tell me. Maybe I'll check them out. Maybe it's a band I've already heard of. But I'm going to get through the ones that I've already got pre-planned before I start working on anything new. And, you know, head over to Divinity Destroyed's Facebook page. Throw them a like. See if you can find a copy of their album somewhere. They're probably still selling on... Yep, Eden and Ashes and Nova are still available on the iTunes store. And the music video for Forever and Ever is still available on YouTube to watch today. Anyway, thank you for watching this band. I hope I've helped you discover a really cool band that you might never have heard of before. Like I said, I've got more of these plans, so keep on watching. Anyway, thank you. Lao Show out. I hold up my hands, I stare, and they are broken, we are All I can do is sit and think.